Well, hello again. This is Mr. Reeves, and we are back to continue with our practice for the CAST test. So hopefully you already watched the video where we got logged in and did questions one through five. And now we're going to go ahead and do questions six through ten. All right, so here we go. So question number six says, enter the value of C when the expression 21.2x plus C is equivalent to 5.3 times the quantity of 4x minus 2.6. Wow, kind of confusing. So when they say enter the value of C, what they're actually asking us to do is find, whoops, find this value of C right there. So we want to find out what that value of C is. Now you notice there's actually two variables. There's also an x, right? But that x and that x are both in the question and the answer. So we're not trying to find the value of x. We're trying to find the value of c. And what they've given us here is an algebraic expression. And here they've given us an algebraic expression. And they want them to be equivalent. So equivalent is another way of saying equal but looks different. So once again, we did this on a previous problem. We have a number outside the parentheses. We're going to have to go ahead and apply the distributive property. So here we go. So we have to do 5.3 times 4. Well, 5 times 4 is 20. 3.3 times 4 is 1.2. So we're going to get 21.2x which is exactly what we have right here. So that part and that part match. Now you'll notice here we have a minus. So I'm going to go ahead and put that minus. And now I need to do 5.3 times 2.6. 5.3 times 2.6. So I'm not seeing a calculator icon here, which means we're going to have to do this the old-fashioned way, 5.3 times 2.6. All right, so here we go. 6 times 3 is 18, carry the 1. 6 times 5 is 30. 30 plus 1 is 31. Then I'm going to go ahead and put my 0. 2 times 3 is 6, and 2 times 5 is 10. Awesome. Now I'm going to go ahead and add these together. And I get 8, 7, 3, and 1. Now hopefully you recall when you are doing a multiplication problem with decimals, when you get your answer, you count how many places there are behind the decimal. That would be 2. And I move 2 places over. And I get 13.78. So now, if I compare this expression to this expression, and remembering I want them to be equivalent, well, again, the first part here is already equivalent. So now let's take a look at the second part. Notice this is a plus and this is a minus. That means when I go to put my answer, it's going to be a negative. Because adding a negative is the same as subtracting a positive. So what I'm looking for is negative 13.78. All right. So I'm going to go ahead now and type that in. And there's my negative sign. And I'm going to go 13.78. Awesome. All right. Let's go to the next question. Question number seven says, select all values that are equivalent to negative 10 sevenths. All right, so just a reminder here, we only have one negative. That's important to know that our answer is negative, especially if we just go ahead and take a look at this first question right here. Hopefully, you know that a negative divided by a negative is a... That's right, positive. 
So this first answer is actually equal to positive 10 sevenths. So this one is a no. All right, so how about this one? This one is negative, so that's hopeful. 3 and 1 sevenths. Now when you look at 10 sevenths, you notice that the top number, the numerator, is bigger than the bottom number, the denominator, which means it is greater than 1. So let's take a look. How many 7s are there in 10? Well, 7 goes into 10 one time with a remainder of 3. So negative 10 sevenths is the same as negative 1 and 3 sevenths because, again, that's like 7 sevenths plus 3 sevenths, right? There's my 1. 1 and 3 sevenths. So this one says negative 3 and 1 seventh. You notice they interchange the 1 and the 3. So guess what, ladies and gentlemen? This one is also no. And this one looks promising because what do we have right here? We've got 1 and 3 sevenths and we've got 1 and 3 sevenths. The problem is we're looking for a negative 1 and 3 sevenths and this one is a positive 1 and 3 sevenths. So this one is also a no. Okay, how about this one? Well, what did we say earlier? A negative divided by a negative is a positive. So this actually becomes a negative 10 sevenths. Hey, we have a winner, right? Because that's what we are looking for, negative 10 sevenths. Finally, we got one that worked. All right, and guess what? Take a look at the last one, negative 1 and 3 sevenths. Negative 1 and 3 sevenths, they're an exact match. So this one is also correct. All right, so for number 7, we're going to go ahead and choose the last two because, again, just a reminder, on these questions that say select all values that are equivalent to, they don't always have more than one answer, but they're usually going to have more than one answer. All right, so that takes care of question number 6 and question number 7. How about question number eight? Oh, we've reached the end of this segment. All right, so we're going to go ahead and move on. All right, yes, we're going to do this. That's fine. All right, question number eight. Here we go. A principal wants to know if students at a particular high school are in favor of a new dress code at their school. The principal is not able to ask the opinion of every student at the school, so she needs to select an appropriate sample of the students to represent the high school. Select which sample of students the principal should choose. Students selected randomly from a list of all students at the school, students sitting at randomly selected tables in the library, students she selects from the hallway between classes, and students selected by the teacher. All right, so got to know a little bit about statistics to answer this one. So the key thing we need to focus on here is she needs to select an appropriate sample of students to represent what? The entire high school. So she doesn't want to sample a group that's going to only represent part of the high school. So let's take a look at these. Let's start at the bottom. Students selected by the teachers. Why should she probably not go that route? Because think about who the teachers are going to pick, right? The teachers are probably going to pick students that they think are cooperative, students that they like, or maybe students they just want to get out of class to go take this survey. So the teachers picking is definitely not random, right? So not random. That's not what we got to. What about students selected from the hallway between classes? Again, uh, which hallway? Where is the principal going to be? What if the principal is in the hallway outside all the upper division science classes? 
or out in the hallway uh, between the PE classes. Um, or just, there, there's no guarantee that that is going to be a good random sample. So again, that is not random. So that's not a good choice. All right. Okay. I think you guys know this one right off the bat. Students in the library. All right. So who's hanging out in the library? Not a random sample, right? This would be a good sample if you wanted to know the opinion of students in the school who hang out in the library. So this one is also not random. Students selected randomly from a list of all students at the school. I like this. You know why I like this? Because they are randomly selected from who? All students. So this one is nice and random. All right, so out of our choices, only the first one is random and the other ones are not random. These would be good if you wanted to know the opinion of students that teachers are likely to pick, students who are in the hallways between classes, certain hallways, and students who hang out in the library. But if you truly want to represent a sample of the entire high school, then you want to go with random students uh, in the whole school. So we're going to go ahead and choose A and move on to the next question. All right, question number nine. Jenny has $25 and she earns $10 for each lawn that she mows. Jenny wants to buy concert, a concert ticket that costs $65. Enter the minimum number of lawns she needs to mow to be able to buy a concert ticket. Okay, so she wants to do what? Jenny wants to buy a concert ticket. So how much is that concert ticket? Well, it is $65. So Jenny wants to earn or she needs $65. Okay, so that's what she needs. And this is what she what? Jenny has $25. So that's how much she has right now, and that's how much she needs. So if she has 25 and she needs 65, the question that we need to ask is what? How much more does she need? How much more? And to find that, what should we do? That's right, we're gonna subtract. So I'm going to take the total that she needs, which is 65. I'm going to subtract the 25 that she already has. 65 minus 25 is $40. So there we go. So Jenny needs to earn $40. How much more does she need? She needs $40 more. And she's going to do that by mowing lawns for what? $10 each, right? All right, so you don't have to be a rocket scientist to know that if she needs $40 and she is earning $10 per lawn, right? What operation do I need to do? I need to divide $10 per lawn. And 40 divided by 10, ladies and gentlemen, is 4. So she needs to mow 4 lawns. All right, so enter the minimum number of lawns. So minimum means the fewest. If she mowed 5 lawns, would she have enough money? Absolutely. Then she'd have an extra $10, 6 7 Maybe she wants to mow some extra lawns. So when she gets to the concert, she could actually buy some food or t-shirts or whatever. But the minimum that she needs is four. So I'm going to go ahead here and type in four and go to our last question for this video. Question number 10. All right, here we go. 
The table shows a proportional relationship between the grams of peanuts and the raisins in a bag of trail mix. Enter the number of grams of peanuts in a bag for every one gram of raisins. All right, so let's take a look at this table. We've got grams of peanuts on the left. We've got grams of raisins on the right. And once again, they tell us that it is a proportional relationship. All right, so just to remind you what a proportional relationship is, a proportional relationship is when the output can be found by multiplying the input by a constant of proportionality. And that K is equal to Y divided by X. Y divided by X. Now in this case, there's not a clear X and Y when you look at it, but it says enter the number of grams of peanuts for every one gram of raisins. So we want to know what is this when this is one. So I'm gonna go ahead and call the grams of peanuts Y, and I'm gonna call the grams of raisins X, and I want to know what the value of K is. And the great thing about a proportional relationship is you can take any of the y's over any of the x's and it will always equal the same thing. So I can go 14 divided by 4, or I could go 21 divided by 6, or I can go 35 divided by 10. All right, now if I simplify 14 over 4, I get 7 over 2. If I simplify 21 over 6, I can divide each of those by 3. I also get 7 over 2. And if I simplify 35 over 10, guess what I get, ladies and gentlemen? Surprise, surprise, 7 over 2. And all of those, if you convert them to a decimal number, are 3.5. So ladies and gentlemen, K is equal to 3.5. So if I go back up here, and again, Y in this case is the grams of peanuts. And X is the grams of raisins. What did we just find out? We found out that the grams of peanuts is 3.5 times the grams of raisins. So 4 times 3.5 is 14. 6 times 3.5 is 21. 10 times 3.5 is 35. So the answer here is going to be 1 times 3.5. And I know that's a really tough math problem for you guys, but 1 times 3.5 is, surprise, surprise, drum roll please, 3.5. All right, so there are 3.5 grams of peanuts for every one gram of raisins. So I'm gonna go ahead and put in my 3.5, and that will take us to the end of these problems. Next time, ladies and gentlemen, we will start on problem number 11. Looks fun.